वेलकम टू सेकेंड डे सेकेंड डे कंटिन्यूस प्रोफेशनल डेवलपमेंट प्रोग्राम दट इज सी पी डी पी ऑन डिजिटल फूड एंड एग्री बिजनेस ड्यूरिंग ट्वेंटी थर्ड ऑफ जान टू थर्ड ऑफ फेब्रवरी ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री ऑर्गेनाइज बाई द इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ प्लांटेशन मैनेजमेंट बेंगलुरु स्पॉन्सर्ड बाय दी And today we have a professor, uh, Shiva Kumar sir, uh, from VIT Business School, uh, Bengaluru, Tamil Nadu. Uh, welcome, sir. Actually, welcome to our VIT uh, program. And uh, I would like to call upon our uh, uh, committee members, uh, Sangavi. Can you please introduce our uh, resource person profile? Jennifer will introduce. Jennifer. Hello, Sangavi. Jennifer. Yes. A very pleasant good evening to the resource person, coordinator of the program, and our beloved participant. This is Jennifer, coordinated from India Institute of Plantation Management, feeling privileged to introduce our respected speaker of the day, Professor Shiva Kumar from VIT Business School, Bellur, Tamil Nadu. Professor Shiva Kumar is a management academic with more than twenty-five years of experience in mainly. teaching research consulting and academic administration sir did his bachelor's and masters at tamil nadu agriculture university coimbatore his masters degree was in agri business management with a thesis in marketing area his doctoral thesis was on cashew export marketing his consulting assignments has so far have been in agri business for companies like myco in addition sir has taught at niam jaipur as a visiting faculty courses such as agricultural input marketing and international marketing his teaching assignments abroad include a stint at oakland university usa as a visiting professor on an exchange program he has taught courses faculty and executive programs at iim bangalore iim vaisal iim kolikot and manish hyderabad Sir started his career with a very brief stint in mushroom protection in a hundred percentage EOQ, and then after post graduation, served for a little over two years as a farm superintendent, managing a hundred acre Ica research farm before joining academics. Sir pursued his post graduation with a Ica Junior Research Fellowship. His two years post doctoral research in Netherlands was on bottom of the pyramid and healthcare. In the recent years, two of Sir's case has won prizes in different categories in the IESB IV Global Case Competition. In two thousand and fourteen, Department of Agriculture and Rural Management (DNAU) invited Sir to conduct a workshop on case writing for its faculty. In addition to these activities. Sir has spearheaded international business school accreditation at TAPMI and VIT. In July 2015, Sir was a participant at Harvard Business School's Global Colloquium on Participant Centered Learning in the USA. Sir has nominated for the Outstanding Case Teacher Competition of the Case Center USA. Recently, NIRD and PR Ministry of Rural Development Government of India selected Sir as a National Resource Person under NRLM program for the theme Livelihood and Value Chain. So, I now invite Professor Shivakumar Sir to take over the session. Welcome, Sir. So now I would like to hand over session to you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, to brief about our uh, professor's profile. Sir, now session is yours, Sir. Ah, uh, very good evening. Are you able to hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Volume clear and uh, yeah, are you able to see also? Ah, volume you have to increase. Sir, yeah, volume. Yeah. Little. Ah, yeah. uh, is it okay now? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, very good evening to all of you, and uh, I hope now uh, my uh, video as well as audio are clear, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. So I'll uh, just share my screen and uh, I'll just start. Okay. Are you able to see the screen? 
Yes, sir, I can see. Uh, possible make it full screen. Uh, yeah, yes, sir, we can. We can see the slide. Is it full screen? Yes, sir, full screen, sir. Yes, yes. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, um, we are going to have in this session uh, some kind of an understanding of agri business strategy and transformation wave of the basically um, this is a very interesting topic in the current context uh, because um, a lot of things are getting into the digital uh, and uh, agriculture is uh, no exception and therefore what we are uh, trying to see here is uh, whether uh, you know, every business is uh, getting affected because of, uh, you know, digitalization and how far this transformation is happening. Uh, this is what we are going to. Um, I see that there is a mix of the participants here. Therefore, uh, you know, just very briefly, uh, what is meant by agri business, I think uh, most of you will be aware. Agri business uh, constitutes uh, all the dimensions of uh, agriculture, basically input as well as uh, output. And agriculture, for those uh, who already studied agriculture, you might be aware that uh, agriculture doesn't mean only um, uh, crop husbandry, it also means animal husbandry. Uh, because in uh, most of the BAC agri courses, we also study uh, horticulture, forestry, fishery, and uh, animal husbandry. And therefore, uh, we are talking of uh, agri business. Uh, it uh, uh, encompasses both crop as well as uh, animal husbandry. Uh, one more uh, aspect which we have to be very clear. Uh, before we get on with this session, is this concept of uh, digitization versus digitalization. Um, so I was just wondering if any of you can actually respond to this. Uh, what's the difference between digitization and digitalization? Any of you? You can just unmute and speak. I was just thinking it should be more interact. Hello. Can any of you just, uh, ah, yeah. Can you, any of you, I mean, your own views need not be the correct answer or it's not the definition. Transforming information into the data. Uh -huh. What is that? Digitization. Okay. And digitalization? Uh, that uh, means uh, taking into the action uh, to the farm. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? I just thought uh, if anybody else can also speak. Uh... Uh, so that we'll make it interactive, not uh, um, anybody else. Okay, so when we say digitization, uh, it, it actually talks about converting information from uh, an analog form into the digital form. Whereas when you are talking of digitalization, uh, we are talking about how processes can be converted into the, uh, you know, digital form. That's the difference that we, uh, uh, difference between digital and uh, di digitization and digitalization. Uh, why I want to spend this little time on this is that when we are talking of digital agriculture or transformation that is happening, um, you must be aware that uh, we are talking of a lot of, uh, you know, processes that are involved in agriculture. And at the same time, 
lot of data also being generated in uh, so which means when we are talking of uh, digital agriculture then both these uh, aspects come into the picture that is we are talking of both digitization of data as well as digitalization of processes uh, that are involved in uh, you know, either capturing the data or processing the data or uh, how do we use this data in terms of getting or uh, taking action. That's exactly what we will be, um, you know, looking at in this. Uh, so, uh, when we talk of, uh, you know, digital agriculture, we are in, uh, you know, this uh, agriculture 4.0. So, agri agriculture 4.0 talks about autonomous farming. Uh, what what does that uh, mean to you? Any of you? Anybody would like to give your views? What is autonomous farming? Uh, sir, shall I uh, shall uh, yes. I tell, sir? So I know. Please, yes, yes, yes. please go ahead. Uh, uh, you need See, not ask my permission. You can go ahead. Uh, Whoever, uh, because of uh, digital, I am also belongs to farmer family. What okay. I understood that this uh, digital, digitalized and uh, digitized digitalization. Mm -hmm. Now uh, take the example, our village side, uh, even mm -hmm. many farmers, they don't have knowledge, like okay. uh, what product they have to produce. Okay. Now, uh, uh, everyone will come to one platform. Okay. So they will start using uh, some uh, applications like apps okay. and they will analyze uh, like, uh, okay. Even now, modern farmers know, sir. They don't okay. know much about uh, how to uh, uh, cropping, all those things. They do. Okay. And it will give idea what crop okay. this, uh, this uh, time we have to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, without uh, depending on others, you should get uh, some idea using some mm -hmm. uh, uh, online platforms. Sir. So oh, okay. uh, uh, that is what I understood, autonomy. Yeah, from your own, uh, okay. you have to learn, uh, you have to uh, produce a certain thing and, uh, in uh, cropping and you have to sell uh, this particular place. Suppose example, yes. uh, yes. suppose so I'm growing you're, you're giving an interesting twist to this word, uh, uh, yes. autonomous. And uh, uh, tomato. Okay. So our area is demand, demand is less, but not okay. India. Uh, that is what okay. Okay. autonomy means uh, even we can sell in other place also okay. our product using okay. uh, online platform okay terms. okay that is what Any, I anybody saying. else uh, uh, anybody else because i i think uh, this word autonomous is being used very commonly in the context of uh, vehicles i don't know whether you have heard of this term autonomous vehicles any of you other than uh, so it is basically autonomous uh, vehicles uh, i think i understood uh, yes uh, is it sharat speaking yeah, uh, yeah please go ahead. Someone, so it is basically a new term where it is a closed loop uh, car where it takes feedback and it uh, drives uh, without any uh, assistance from human being maybe Correct. basically absolutely Absolutely. So, autonomous, uh, uh, the word autonomous in the context of autonomous vehicles or autonomous cars, etc. is instead of me using uh, an app and then uh, telling exactly which, uh, from which, I mean, uh, you know, place you want to go to which place and then uh, there is a driver who responds and all of that. Instead of that, the vehicle itself on its own will come from the place where it is parked. And they, these are driverless vehicles. They are just, uh, you know, autonomously, uh, which means on their own, uh, take you from one place to another. Uh, means uh, these are ones uh, which are available mostly in uh, you know, US and Europe. And what's happening is uh, 
the job of the driver is now being replaced by you know artificial intelligence and uh, the car actually uh, works on its own now um, you can ask whether it's this kind of an application has got use only in uh, the transportation industry if you take even agriculture transportation it should be in applicable so when we say autonomous farming uh, what one is talking of is you know driverless tractors uh you know uh, uh, human being replaced by artificial intelligence in terms of uh, applying fertilizer pesticide irrigation etc so several components of agriculture uh, i am just talking about only the crop husbandry part being done autonomously without human intervention uh, is what we are uh, terming as autonomous farming and for this autonomous farming to happen obviously you need uh, the use of uh, technology and digital technology is the one that is being used uh, you know very ubiquitously in terms of uh, 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 making this happen okay um so uh, the next aspect which is i think is uh, mentioned here and that is why i used also the term ubiquitous ubiquitous agriculture sensing uh, what does uh, this mean to you any of you ubiquitous agriculture sensing It'll be interesting to get your views uh, sensors which is present everywhere sir everywhere correct very good um, okay so what does that mean can you give me an example uh sensors to uh, uh, get the uh, soil uh, uh, moisture content uh, temperature absolutely. content etc like that so absolutely absolutely so from uh, leaf and stem and root and soil and uh, you know machinery everywhere you find uh, the use of uh, sensors right so what is the use of the sensors uh, you know sensors are basically being uh, used in order to uh, you know capture as much data as possible uh, sense uh, for example movements um, you know sense different kinds of parameters Uh, at uh, different points uh, and that is the one which is now available as information in the digital form and that is being used for the purpose of uh, making decisions in um, which means uh, one uh, aspect which is increasingly penetrating uh, agriculture uh, what we call as agriculture 4.0 is the ubiquitous use of sensors in uh, agriculture even on animals um, you know sensors are being uh, used to identify animals to identify the uh, reproductive stage of the uh, you know uh, these kind of applications are now and the third aspect that is mentioned here in terms of agriculture 4.0 is trustworthy food supply okay so what does one understand by trustworthy food supply supply which is provided by people yeah please go ahead supply which is validated by uh, one of you can speak i think uh, sarath you wanted to speak you please go ahead supply which is validated by certain people certified people supply which is validated by certain five can you give me an example what does that mean like uh, we have apssi certification ass certification means those okay certification okay. have values so similarly okay. why uh, why do you think they have value like they follow a certain procedure 
like uh, it's same everywhere uh huh so if they follow so the procedure it is same everywhere etc what does it actually provide it provides like a trust like if someone satisfies like fases i means they have some mm. safety is like that it builds the trust the certification has a trust okay okay uh i think some uh, yuvaraj was also trying to yes sir am i audible sir yeah 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 you are audible please go ahead yeah uh, to ensure food safety and food quality throughout the supply chain correct so how do you ensure food safety and food quality uh i think uh, now we can uh, like people are uh, implementing blockchain technology okay okay so that the information will be like uh, decentralized so each and everyone okay. in the supply chain will come to know what are the exact data has been transferred from each and every members absolutely so it's a very good uh, you know point so now uh, you know typically what hap- happens in agriculture is um you know different kinds of inputs get transformed as part of agriculture right feed is an input fertilizer is an input water is an input. okay all of these inputs together transform into uh, some kind of a product and they get transformed further as you go along the supply uh, chain or value chain depending upon uh, what is the way in which you look at it. right so in each of these stages as the transformation of the product happens in uh, and we are talking of agri business one of the things that uh, the next stage in the supply chain or the value chain is interested in is how far can it trust in terms of uh, how truly is this transformation happen for example um, you know uh, in the case of organic agriculture if somebody is into the organic agri business then the question is how much of this product let's say for example some oh drumstick is organic drumsticks are being produced okay a farm is producing organic drumstick and it is exporting abroad the question is somebody who is sitting in let's say uh, australia or japan is importing drumsticks from india is wondering whether really it is organic or not how do we capture that so i think the point which uh, Yuvraj was trying to say is very important. So you're capturing data across the value chain to find out at each stage who are the stakeholder who is involved. Uh, ensures that uh, there is uh, you know a greater amount of uh, surety of uh, the product being organic compared to uh, and this happens through uh, uh, um uh, for uh, digital capture uh, of the data and it, you also ensure that uh, this data is not corrupted across uh, with the use of this block right so which means uh, even to ensure um, you know safety food safety food quality food certification right Uh, in all these cases you have to actually use uh, digital technology and more importantly i think it also relates to what we call uh, especially in the case of food that we consume traceability for which again we use uh, digital technology there are several companies which are into this particular business to ensure exactly where the product is coming from and what are the ingredients used. what kind of transformation has happened uh, is done using digital technology especially blockchain right so which means uh, if you go back to this uh, uh, whole transformation that you are talking about um agri business which was basically uh, one which uh, related to use of human and animal power in agriculture 1.0 as transformed from use of machinery fertilizer and pesticide uh, to uh, automation of several processes to almost in many of the very well developed countries 
autonomous farming, trustworthy supply chain, and ubiquitous uh, sensor. All of which uh, have uh, a strong component of uh, digital technology. You know, that is why we can as well say that it is digital agriculture or digital agri-business uh, era that uh, we are going to across. In India, we are uh, yet to reach that stage, but uh, very soon as many of the digital technologies become uh, quite uh, uh, comfortable in terms of cost, uh, we'll find that the use of these technologies will be a big way. Uh, you know, in the Indian context. So this is another uh, way of putting in the same thing. Uh, but uh, there is, uh, there are two things that we are uh, uh, looking at here. One is that, uh, you know, both in terms of production as well as complexity, from agriculture 1.0 to 4.0 right now, mm. there's, a, there's been you know, increase. There has been an increase in terms of production of different kinds of agriculture product, both in terms of uh, quantity and uh, you know, variety, and also in terms of complexity that is involved because we are talking of several factors now. Uh, Etc. These kind of complexities also uh, increasing uh, along with the use of digital technology or what use of internet of things, artificial intelligence, etc. We will be discussing very shortly. So now, when we say uh, digitalization of agriculture, because uh, right in the beginning, uh, you know, we talked about this distinction between, you know, digitization versus digitalization. Digitization is generally only talking about uh, you know, analog to digital part, whereas digitalization actually talks about uh, converting of processes into the uh, uh, converting them into the uh, digital, right? Uh, so if you take, uh, you know, digitalization of agriculture, what are the factors uh, that uh, will contribute to better digitalization in agriculture or increase in the pace of digitalization of agriculture, if you are to look at that? Uh, I think the four components that are mentioned here. So the first uh, component is ob obviously one um, oh, support for digital agricultural um, innovations. So you have uh, digital technologies like robots, blockchain, artificial intelligence. But then um, you know, if you look at applications, they are all mostly in the context of uh, different other industries. Not many in the context of uh, agriculture. So, therefore, what happens is when uh, uh, you know you are able to bring in uh, these digital technologies as solutions that will help in the different components of agriculture, then we are talking of digital agricultural innovations. For example, in production, how can robots, uh, for example, uh, can we have a robotic weeder? Okay, this will be able to sense between what is the main crop, what is the weed, and uh, you know, be able to pull out or retain uh, or sense exactly how much of weed is okay in terms of uh, managing the, uh, the uh, 
uh, if you are looking at it that way, then I think we are converting uh, the robotic technology, which is a digital technology, to a solution in one of the processes in production, namely uh, Similarly, uh, you know, it could be in terms of fertilizer application, fertilizer application, uh, irrigation. So what we are talking of are digital uh, solutions, which are basically digital agriculture uh, innovation. Now, if you uh, think on these lines, again, if you look at the uh, various other uh, components of uh, agriculture which have to work in tandem, you find that uh, the market, finance, supply chain, uh, you know, intelligence with regard to both the production as well as the environmental conditions. All of them require use of uh, digital technology. What happens is we are developing innovative agriculture solutions using digital technologies. Now, this is a very important component of uh, digitalization of agriculture because without uh, uh, applications, it's not going to um, uh, really happen in terms of. Uh, either the breadth or the depth of uh, uh, digitization as well as digitalization. Okay, that's the first uh, part. The uh, second part in terms of uh, how uh, digitalization for is that we should enable big data and uh, you know, analytics. Uh, for which I think uh, there are two components involved and it's very nicely uh, depicted here. We need to have digital identity. I think even now it's not as widespread uh, as we imagine. Uh, agriculture land records are not digitized yet. And there are no uh, perfect boundaries for each one of the you know lands that are available all across the country and um, you know we therefore don't have specific identity for each one of those uh, lands that are available. and uh, on top of it uh, superimposing it with for example, uh, is it owned by businesses? Is it owned by individuals? Um, is it owned by non-business institutions? What is the nature of connection between uh, all of these, et cetera? Uh, that amount of uh, data uh, to the precise uh, form that is required, it's yet to be, you know, you have technologies like uh, drones, satellites, and sensors, but are we able to collect all the data with, uh, with regard to uh, using these different uh, technologies so that it will enable you know, quality content with regard to the data that is generated and therefore the analytics uh, that can be used uh, um, by uh, utilizing the big data that is, uh, because it's a huge amount of uh, uh, data that can be. Uh, data is captured uh, across inputs, uh, production, processing, yes. And there is a, you know, for every individual crop, land, individual business, etc., there's a lot of data that can be uh, captured. Um, whether this is being enabled uh, is a big question because once this is enabled, then uh, agri business, uh, in terms of entering the um, digital era, uh, becomes much more. Uh, and, uh, 
right any questions so far on this part okay the third aspect uh, that we have in terms of uh, digitalization or uh, agriculture or agri business is the business development services that are there uh, across which will actually uh, facilitate uh, agri business so that would uh, represent uh, organizations like cooperatives corporations Um, you know, when we say digitization of agriculture, it's also within a context. So you can't do it uh, individually unless there are, uh, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, the point three and four are uh, kind of interlinked. Because unless the business development services, uh, you know, are digitally enabled, or capable, it's very difficult to actually uh, implement uh, For example, um, if a financial institution, let's say for the, uh, the banks from where agri business uh, get their loan, um, they are not interacting through the digital mode, they are not enabling the digital mode or uh, transactions, or they're not keeping track of exactly what's happening to the loan through the various uh, you know processes that are happening in the group. Then uh, in both ways, digitization or digitalization has not happened. That's what it is. Plus, unless the form itself is uh, not digitized or digitalized, how will the bank actually be able to? Uh, capture that data. If the form is digitized, but if the bank uh, doesn't have the wherewithal to uh, monitor digitally what is happening in the form, for whatever money that it is, there again, uh, you are talking of absence of facilitation of business development. So essentially, what it means is that um, whoever is involved in, in uh, or whoever is involved in input supply, uh, or uh, who are buyers or processors, then we are talking of the entire supply chain of the value chain, appreciating and using both digitization as well as digitalization, so that uh, you know it all works. Otherwise, what would happen is I have a, uh, you know most of the things things digitized as part of production. It will uh, the markets accept uh, you know this? Do they have the capability? So basically, we are talking of uh, uh, the stakeholders, different stakeholders who are part of the business, also uh, joining this bandwagon of uh, digital. The last part uh, in terms of uh, helping. Mm, digital agri business enabling. Uh, okay, every uh, stakeholder is interested in getting into this. What about, for example, policies um, regarding how data will be captured, where will it be, who use this data, whether that data will be uh, you know, secure. So, data governance issues. Policies regarding electronic data or any of the aspects of uh, you know, the uh, uh, how about the need uh, uh, and access to that, that part? And then, since we are talking about uh, products, what about uh, physically? Um, availability of good roads and access to roads and kind of energy requirements that uh, in, in this level of it's a 24 by 7 central uh, data 
electricity, good roads, all the digitization that we are talking of, which means when you're talking of, uh, you know, digital agriculture or digitization, the business, unless these four components work in tandem, you know, the fruits of whatever that you are looking at in terms of you know, digital agriculture. Right. Any questions uh, on this? So what are the uh, typical um, technologies that are uh, used? One is sensors and robotics, which uh, we are quite aware of. Which, uh, um, sense, which means collect uh, data from different points and different sources. Um, you know, make decisions. So finally, we are talking of either a business or an individual or an organization using this uh, you know, data that is collected. Now, for that to happen, um, you know, for data to be you know, processed, and it's assumed that uh, we are talking of cloud computing, which means uh, a service remote location, getting connected to the data that is being sensed in the farm, and the connectivity becomes important. And connectivity also means interoperability of different kinds of data uh, that is generated across different kinds of, uh, you know, products. For example, a sensor that is attached, I mean, that is kept in the soil, that's used uh, in the um, last point where uh, uh, trip irrigation the one that is there attached to the tank that disperses uh, fertilizers or pesticides. Um, will all these data be able to talk to each other? What are the protocols? What kind of sensors are being used? Do they have uh, some kind of a uh, one protocol by which uh, you can collect data in a form uh, that is easily used uh, or uh, analysis, which means we are coming to the uh, next stage with data analytics, uh, where the big data gets transformed into useful decision making uh, with the help of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So, then is another uh, technological. And once uh, we do that, uh, how does uh, it actually present itself in the form of which means the data visualization part also comes in. So which means uh, in each of these cases we are talking of uh, technology being used uh, in a very uh, complex way in order to help in um, Digitization. Um, I will quickly uh, go through um, another Hello, sir, your voice is breaking. Sir. Are you able to are you able to hear me now clearly? Yes, sir. Now sir. Now it's okay. Ah. Uh, so what essentially is happening uh, with regard to uh, you know, digital technology is like this, what is represented here in the slide. So let's say, for example, we're talking of a tractor, uh, you know, the typical mechanical tractor that one uses uh, is a mechanical product, but if it becomes a smart product, if uh, there are, um, this data that is captured, uh, from the tractor and it's uh, monitored either 
in situ or uh, remotely about several uh, dimensions of the track. The wear and tear, the amount of uh, pollution, uh, the level of uh, fuel that is there. All this um, uh, makes it a smart product. Now, uh, this smart product becomes the smart connected product. So the starting point is actually the step two, where from a regular product, mechanical product, it becomes a smart product, which means the digital technology has come in here. And as it becomes a smart connected product, as it gets, uh, you know, integrated with other kinds of systems that can be attached to the tractor, namely planters, combined harvest. And it becomes a farm equipment system, which needs to be uh, oh, wirelessly digital. And then uh, if you're taking it uh, to the next level, we are then talking of a system of systems, which means digital agribusiness or uh, digital agriculture represents actually a system of systems we're starting from one farm equipment system. If you also have a weather data system, facility system, seed optimization, system, all of them are interacting with each other in order to make farm management better optimized. Then we are talking of the real um, complete uh, use of uh, digital business. And therefore, uh, to my knowledge, in the Indian context, we are yet to reach, uh, you know, probably stage three or stage four. Maybe in some cases there is stage two. So it's, uh, you know, requires quite some effort in order to really work towards uh, digital business, looking at it as a system of uh, systems. Because it's not just the smart product which makes digital agriculture. That's the point that I want to make with this particular. So essentially, what uh, happens is this: that from a crop, just to take an example of how the transformation actually happens. In from the crop, the sensors actually provide data to a platform. This software platform. Uh, you know, uh, is uh, the applicator of all that data, which uh, with the help of uh, artificial decision, and this decision uh, really gets into actual implementation uh, in the. And this is what happens in digital. So. Um, what are the um, you know, impacts of digital agriculture? Um, you know, one is uh, you can have sustainable food and nutrition security because you are able to measure, track, uh, really look at every aspect of uh, really climate, climate resilience, higher yields, higher incomes. And also on the other side, financial inclusion, because with data, you can actually find out who is able to, you know, finances, what's happening to women, men. So you're able to capture uh, data about land holding size, uh, who is the land holder, how much of employment is actually happening, what is the amount of uh, mechanization, digitalization that all this information can be captured. But for all this to happen, we must have an enabling uh, environment and also the digital technologies uh, with transformation. So um, digitalization and digitization in agriculture can bring in a big agriculture transform. And that's what is depicted in this particular um, Uh, one other question, and I think uh, you know, this all of us would always have, is that is it only for uh, large farms? Okay, 
because we know that in uh, most of the very developed countries, this is what happens. But large firms use all of this. They don't have enough of manpower, and that is why digitization and digitization is helping them. Without uh, you know people, unmanned, uh, autonomous uh, farming has come in because of their environment. Will it work in the context of a small? If you look at, I think in the Indian context we have more of small farms, and uh, if you look at one of the beam of agriculture uh, in India, is that we have what is called as disguised unemployment. Large number of people working in a small farm. Now, with uh, increasing opportunities happening in, of course, in manufacturing as well as services, as more people shift from agriculture to other forms of uh, other uh, aspects of the economy, uh, rural to urban migration happening. I think it also provides a fantastic opportunity even in the Indian context. Uh, all and future and how that is possible uh, in what is now you may be wondering where all this is possible so here is a list of uh, a large number of agri tech companies so all this digitization digitalization of agriculture in money a very innovative set of companies, which are startups, they are trying to bring in a lot of digital technologies in terms of applications. This is a huge list of so many companies, some of which are also operating in India, which are you can have a look at them and probably go through the kind of work that they are doing abroad and also in India. To understand the level of uh, um, level or extent to which digitization has happened. Mm. Mm. Indian context. I think this is the last part. Um, this agriculture 4.0 uh, is not without its challenges. Um, you have several issues with regard to these uh, major aspects. Raised application and systems. Uh, just to take one of them, if you consider the devices, the kind of environment in which you work, the electronic devices uh, you know, manage with a very harsh field environment, which means uh, the weather as well as, you know, very uh, dusty conditions will work. What about power consumptions and how about the costs that are involved while you use the device with smart capability, digital capability? These are the kinds of challenges that one faces when we are getting into 4.0. I think uh, we have a short break here. And we'll, uh... okay, thank you. Is that fine? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, we'll get back after 10 minutes. Yes. Thank you.
Uh, good evening. Uh, are you able to hear me? Hello, good evening once again. Are you able to hear me? Good evening, sir. We are able to hear you. Okay. Yes, Is it better uh, because I have uh, removed this, uh, you know, the uh, connectivity, the earphone and all that. Is it better now? Uh, you are able to hear me better? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, should we go ahead? Is everybody there? Yes, sir. Uh, so from, uh, you know, digital agriculture, we are going to an entirely different topic, which is uh, implementation of MEP 2020. Okay. Are you able to see the uh, slide in full screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so before I start off, uh, I just want to know how many of you are aware of NEP 2020 and what is it that uh, you know of? Anybody can speak. The National Education Policy 2020. Any of you? Okay, uh, so let's look at, uh, you know, one. Uh... Hello? Uh, plans to bring. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It plans to bring uh, some major changes to education right now. Okay. okay. And uh, the multiple uh, entry and uh, exit point has been uh, defined like uh, okay, okay. 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 So um, I think uh, uh, you've highlighted um, one or two uh, points that they have. So uh, yeah, a independent uh, organization called Call Falls NEP survey. Um, I'm just putting this up to you uh, only to talk about why we are having this particular session on NEP 2020 implementation. Um, NEP 2020 is national education policy, but then um, there is a vast difference. Uh, those of you who have studied, uh, you know, management and you studied strategic management, you know that there's a big difference between policy and strategy and its implementation, okay? So policies can be uh, derived on the basis of a lot of discussion and then, uh, you know, arrived at. But then finally, uh, how is it uh, that it will get implemented or what are the kind of issues that one would face, etc. Is implementation itself a problem if you are looking at it that way? Uh, I think this survey actually talks about a uh, few aspects uh, which we'll discuss in uh, you know, uh, detail. Okay. The most important one is it says, uh, you know, 44% said uh, more than five years it will take to effectively implement NEP in higher education institutions. So, uh, you know, all of us who are here are from higher educational institutions, which means we are talking of uh, college and above, that is college and university, et cetera. And, uh, you know, the national education policy it, uh, does not only talk about, uh, you know, higher education, but also um, education at the uh, lower levels, which is uh, primary, secondary, higher secondary kind of education. And they have uh, changed the nomenclature of uh, uh, the education system itself, uh, you know, in this new education or national education policy. If you look at, uh, you know, what are the benefits, what are the challenges, etc. One uh, benefit that they are talking of is multidisciplinary learning outcomes. Okay. Uh, instead of talking of very uh, uh, specialized courses, etc. Uh, and in situations where a large number of jobs are available in, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, one kind of a uh, you know sector compared to other forms then what's happening is uh, uh, you know what one is learning uh, during uh, the course of higher education and what one is working on is very very dif uh, different and therefore uh, both uh, the industry as well as uh, the you know institution as well as the individual the student uh, all of them face a uh, problem and therefore one of the things that uh, is being talked about in this national education policy new uh, national education policy 2020 is multidisciplinary uh, you know learning outcome you're not just learning Uh, very specialized in one area but across uh, multiple areas and there is an opportunity that is given uh, the visa that and uh, because of this multidisciplinary uh, learning outcome uh, obviously like uh, what i am talking of just now it increases the employability of the uh, students because if you learn multiple skills if you learn multiple kind of subjects and i think those of us who are from an agriculture background uh, will relate to this very well because in agriculture uh, many of us study anything starting from history and geography of agriculture geography meteorology you know um, you know computer science uh, soil water conservation pathology entomology sociology psychology of farmers economics these are uh, you know totally varied kind of subjects coming from uh, multiple disciplines but what uh, we are quite aware is that unless we study all these different dimensions extension requires understanding of sociology and uh, psychology uh sciences require an understanding of different kinds of sciences namely pathology entomology nematology you know soil science soil water conservation basically engineering different uh, you know uh, during production engineering uh, equipment agriculture engineering equipment processing equipment post harvest processing you know food processing etc we study different uh, aspects of uh, agriculture all of them borrowing from basically multiple uh, disciplines which makes it uh, easy for an agriculture graduate to get into any kind of job and you must be aware that this is happening for long you will find agriculture graduates in administrative positions purely administrative positions uh then there are people who are into you know banks they those who are into research development so um one um, big advantage because of this multidisciplinary learning is the employability of the students who have this uh, you know uh, this kind of a learning which is a benefit uh, but the uh, uh, kind of aspects that uh, you know are more uh, challenging is how do you create multidisciplinary faculty or multidisciplinary schools in a campus because our indian education system uh, you know when yeah, initially we started off we started off with uh, you know several institutes of national importance on unitary disciplines for example we had indian institutes of technology okay which are highly technology focused then uh, we had indian institute of management which is all management uh, focused so like this we had uh, you know institutions which come from uh, unitary uh, disciplines uh, you know typically if you look at uh, most of the you know higher education institutions abroad you will find that uh, um, there are lot of these uh, universities which are multidisciplinary and you have colleges which uh, specialize within the university almost in the same geographic location um, in uh, different uh, you know disciplines for example there could be a college of design 
then there is a college of engineering then there's a college of agriculture then there's a college of uh, you know basic sciences so what happens uh, in the case of a person registering in any of the programs in the you know university abroad is that uh, you know they could take uh, some minimum set of courses in uh, one discipline and also take you know so engineering student will take psychology course a design student will take uh, an agriculture course etc these things actually happen but then in the indian context uh, you know till now uh, we are not yet open to and aware of these kind of multidisciplinary possibilities within the uh, campus that's what is mentioned as one of the uh, challenges and one of the reasons why this is a challenge is basically our own perception or attitude towards what is education what should it be and that is based on the history that we have had about education till now right and therefore uh you know uh, the other discipline which i have done you know uh, apart from bsc agree is management so if you take management for, to get into masters in uh, business administration or business management this is a basic requirement of a bachelor's degree but that bachelor's degree can uh, come in any discipline uh, you could be a bsc max you could be a ba in english you could be a bsc in agriculture you could be a btech but all of them are allowed to be uh, getting into masters in business administration program now if you take this kind of a scenario into consideration why can't this uh, be looked at in the context of uh, bachelor's education or masters education across other disciplines is what is the major uh, question that is arising and Uh, this is not being uh, accepted very easily in uh, you know several contexts and that's why if you look at a major challenge that is mentioned here uh, among higher education leaders who were surveyed for this particular uh, poll uh, was uh, change management among uh, stakeholders and if you say stakeholders Uh, we are talking of parents we are talking of uh, faculty we are talking of students we are talking of industry uh, some of them are not very you know clearly open to this idea of uh, a multidisciplinary kind of a uh, context now what are the things that are most difficult to implement now, if you look at the challenges in implementation and they are talking of multi multi entry exit points uh, and uh, what we are talking of in this case is at the end of first year you get a certification at the end of second year you get a diploma at the end of third year you get a degree at the end of fourth year you get a degree with honors at the end of fifth year you get a post graduate certificate you know like that uh, if it goes on then what happens is you are allowing multiple entry and uh, exit then the question is for most of the educational institutions uh, how would they anticipate what is going to happen in terms of student numbers right because the faculty numbers uh, depend upon um, you know an understanding of uh, student numbers and therefore uh, if we um, allow for multiple entry and exit points what is going to be the impact in terms of uh, student numbers how do we actually calculate pass percentage right we know a program is 3 years and somebody can uh, pass out i mean join in batch 2020 and is going to pass out in 2023 3 year program then we know how many people joined in 2020 how many people uh, you know came out in 2023 but if we say you know you can leave at the end of 21 22 23 etc then how do we actually uh, i mean there are these kind of questions uh, that come in in terms of what do these mean for the institution also for the individual and for employers 
so would you take people with uh, certification with diploma with uh, degree etc and uh, at what level would as a employer allow them to actually uh, go back again to complete the rest of the program etc these kind of questions uh, actually uh, you know uh, are the ones that are making it the most difficult to implement when you are talking of multi uh, entry exit points okay um, what is the um, you know expected outcome of uh, leveraging technology for nep implementation which means how much can we use uh, technology in order to implement uh, all this uh, choice and flexibility that is uh, available etc i think technology is the only one that can help in managing this complexity and that will result in uh, you know uh, significant reduction in the complexity that we are talking of and uh, you know transparency in terms of every aspect every part of the educational process uh, which is starting from uh, admissions till uh, the person parts, passes out with a uh, degree and technology can help in terms of crafting uh, one's own degree because once you are either talking of a choice based credit system uh, which means you can pick a set of uh, courses with a number of credits across in different kinds of uh, schools or colleges within a university um you know how do we do it how is it uh, available uh, to the uh, student if you look at i think uh, making it available in a digital form in one platform uh, you know university is what is going to you know help that's where uh, you know leveraging of technology becomes uh, very important that will also help in increasing academic and administrative efficiency so no point in uh, you know dealing with uh, you know what we call as pen and paper and uh, you know problems and filing and uh, you know lost documents and things like that you know the digital uh, technology actually will be able to capture a lot of uh, um, what we are talking of in terms of uh, these processes in uh, uh, academics and administration therefore uh, technology is going to be a major force when you are talking of uh, you know nep implementation um you know if in using technology we are able to also you know uh, encourage student and faculty collaborative activities that again uh, is going to in a great way uh, help in nep uh, you know implementation and we are talking of a fully flexible learning system that can happen because of uh, the support that we are getting from um, you know nep now having looked at uh, this survey i think uh, it could be a good time to actually look at exactly what does nep actually talk about what are the key principles okay um these are some of the key principles that based on which the new or the national education policy 2020 has been uh, looked at number one respect for diversity and uh, you know uh, local content which means that uh, one debate uh, that has been going on in terms of whether everything should be in uh, one particular medium one particular way etc i think uh, that has been uh, kind of uh, set to a full stop by this key principle namely diversity and local context uh, why not uh, you know uh, teach science uh, let's say in tamil kannada telugu malayalam etc uh, till the graduation level and why can't you know a phd in science uh, using vernacular medium and what about the nature of the pedagogy that you use has it to be only textbook and you know a particular method why not uh, everything be completely practical right um you know where is it possible Do, does it have to be only in an enclosed classroom uh, if that kind of infrastructure is not available can we think of uh, 
you know uh, a curriculum pedagogy that can um, gel well with the requirements of uh, a particular locality so these are the kinds of things that one is talking about when we say uh, respect for diversity and local context and um, equity and inclusion means that uh, you know it's for, uh, not for namesake that you say that there is participatory decision making how are faculty involved how are staff involved non teaching staff involved how are students involved uh, in the whole process of educational decisions uh, that's a key uh, aspect what about the community uh, how are the local leaders appreciating an educational institute's presence in terms of a higher education institution uh, those aspects uh, actually come in when you are talking of community participation all right if there is an educational institution though we are talking of uh, you know achieving uh, global levels of excellence uh, uh, you know benchmarking ourselves with the top educational institutions across the world uh because most of education institutions that we are talking of higher education or lower uh, level educational institutions um <clears throat> they all are physical institutions that are in a particular setting the question is how do we interact with the community do we spend time with the uh, the local community what do we do uh, because of our presence in that particular uh, community those aspects have to be taught uh, thought of very uh, carefully so we are talking of what is called as institutional social responsibility uh, either philanthropic private or community uh, participation facilitation encouragement uh, from uh, students from non teaching staff faculty how the institution itself is uh, trying to reach out to the community to do you know something for their good or how is the community how are we engaging with the community to ensure that uh, there is a harmonious relationship between the community and the uh, you know institution this is uh, one of the things that we are talking on in terms of a key principles of nep um we need not talk about the next one i think all of us know the use of technology and how during covid uh, we are kind of forced to use technology and now we are trying to understand in what kind of context technology will work better and uh, in what context it will not and how to use them um, you know which kind of uh, you know students and programs uh, will it work better etc i think we have learned in two years during covid uh, as to how to use uh, technology and i think uh, um thanks to nep 2020 which almost coincided with uh, you know uh, the release of nep 2020 and its implementation and what we saw in terms of covid i think use of technology we have learned uh, you know a lot and i think uh, uh, that's something uh, that uh, is a key aspect which differentiates itself from what we have seen as education policies in the past um <clears throat> the uh, other aspects which i think uh, are more at a you know higher level in terms of principles of education is uh, emphasis on conceptual understanding uh, unique capabilities that means uh, not trying to say that uh, unless you score good marks you are the uh, you know best student and others are not understanding the capabilities and making education as personalized as possible based on the capabilities of the students uh, that's what is uh, one of the other things that is being uh, you know uh, talked about as a key principle of uh, uh, nep and um, you know one major aspect which i think is coming in uh, this emphasize conceptual understanding as well as critical thinking and creativity is that uh, you know somehow the indian system uh, uh, is more attuned to rote learning um, you know this is just uh, uh, understanding or memorizing uh, 
content and then reproducing it uh, during the exams so almost like study the previous night forget the next night kind of a thing now uh, when you have this kind of a system in place what happens is uh, you know the one question that is being asked about the education system here in india is that why is it in india we don't have uh, great innovations like we see uh, in many of the uh, developed countries uh, one major difference is in terms of how much do we encourage critical thinking and uh, creativity across the entire education system and more importantly in uh, higher education um, i think those of you who are in the you know teaching profession might uh, be aware of this that even after coming to higher education let's say for example even at the masters level um, the habits of a school don't change which means you are looking for that examination what kind of questions will be asked what will be the nature of the question paper how many questions which are the portions and how much should i read and uh, you know uh, what is to be done in the exam which i think uh, you know kills the very idea of what we are talking of as education for a change education for innovation education for better uh, decision making education that makes students to think critically and also bring in greater creativity which i think uh, are all issues uh, right now and nep 2020 actually um, really uh, brings in that change by saying that this is one of the key principles of uh, you know nep right and um, the last one which uh, Uh, which is also very important uh, is uh, what is happening to assessment right uh, whether it is research assessment or regular assessment of uh, learning outcomes of taught courses i think one big uh, issue in terms of why uh, there is more of concept i mean less of conceptual understanding more of rote learning and more of learning for exams is because of the nature of our examination systems even with continuous assessments i think in many of the higher educational institutions we still have a huge weightage given for uh, uh, the final examination right so when are we going to change the system where there is not one examination which will have a huge weightage but continuous assessments and review in terms of uh, learning that will be better right uh, so if you look at all these points i think uh, many of them are really very practical and uh, at the same time ones which bring in a major change in the uh, current system and uh, that is where i think the national education policy 2020 in terms of key principles makes a uh, Uh, big difference in terms of transforming the education system in our country now um what i want uh, from you uh, if you a few at least is um all these principles are uh, you know fine uh, what do you think are the issues or problems in terms of implementation i think there are quite a few of you who are already in the you know field of education which means you are actually professors in uh, you know agri business or uh, management sir shall i speak sir yeah yeah i know who is speaking uh, so uh, this is this is dr rajesh uh, uh, from bangalore sir yeah please go ahead see in karnataka last uh, year they introduced already we completed one batch of uh, one year okay uh, that mean two semester where do you, uh, um, you know what kind of uh, university or college do you work bangalore university affiliated loyola degree college okay so what do you teach so i teach uh, commerce subjects commerce, commerce. and management bcom and uh, yeah, bba subjects very good yeah please so, go ahead 
So mm-hmm. now uh, we already experienced it with uh, two semester exams. Okay. Okay. Now uh, what what uh, techno technical uh, glitches? Suppose mm-hmm. you take the example, sir. Mm-hmm. How uh, now uh, all the university will comes uh, to one banner, one person control. That means higher education council uh, uh, they built. So mm-hmm. everyone, suppose you take the example. Uh, Bangalore University, they will give to Higher Education Council, Karnataka Higher Education Council result declaration. Ah, ah let, um, uh, what's your name? Uh, let me. Dr. Rajesh. And uh, Dr. Rajesh, uh, yes. my suggestion is, I am trying to say that uh, there are these key principles which you see on the slide here, right? Yes, sir. Uh, what I am asking you is, uh, these are the. Uh, very uh, exalted ideas with which the NEP 2020 uh, has been based on. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You said that uh, last one year it has been implemented in Karnataka. Yes, sir. And you are talking about, you are the right person because you are going to talk about what challenges you faced in implementation on these aspects. That is what I want to understand because if you get on to how the system is and things like that, I think we are going in a different track. I want you to stick to these principles. You can take one or two principles and let me know what kind of issues you have faced. So now, first one, sir, academic issues. Okay. Academic syllabus. Okay. And uh, syllabus, uh, uh, they will speak in higher education according to NEP, state level syllabus. Okay. But uh, university level, they will issue different syllabus. Later, they will issue another circular. Okay. You have to study, suppose, digital fluency, entire Karnataka. Okay. Uh, then uh, later, they will change university wise. Example, uh, our university, we are selecting spreadsheet. That okay. means uh, in between notification will come. First time we are experiencing now, sir. Okay. So okay. that's why in between, okay. uh, we don't have the sufficient time to prepare for students. Huh. No, no, Prepare that's fine, but uh, is it a small glitch or is it a major problem when we are so, talking about uh, Now, this is the major problem, sir, because okay. uh, we, here we don't know. We want state syllabus. Okay. Suppose okay. one student is transferring from uh, Bangalore University to Mangalore University. Okay. This is not smooth process. Okay. Okay. And okay. the technology glitches, uh, still we are not able to get a complete result of a first semester. Already we completed uh, two year uh, two semester exams. Okay. First semester uh, results itself we could not able to get completely. I am not blaming uh, NEP sir. Okay. But uh, uh, part of uh, implementation. Implementation. Uh, implementation uh, issue. Yes sir. Because M K Sridhar is my mm. teacher. Mm. Uh, the NEP second man. Uh, NEP. Mm. <laughs> He's my teacher, mm. uh, Professor M K Sridhar. Mm. Mm. Okay. So that is what, uh, and uh, village side, sir, mm. because, uh, many people uh, see now fees payment. Okay. We have to pay advance. Suppose government colleges, okay, private colleges, so even many poor people, they will study. Okay. And uh, they should produce uh, fees receipts. They could okay. not able to pay, uh, suppose 40,000, 50,000 one time. Okay. That is also one of the important because they will pay installment wise. Now, according okay. to NEP, there is uh, less scope for pay, uh, paying the fees. Yeah. These are all uh, three important uh, concerns. Sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, yes, any, uh, anybody else who would uh, want to stick to these key principles of yeah, NEP? Sir, and uh, NEP uh, what? This is Sharath from uh, National Institute of Engineering, myself. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, from the technical perspective, like uh, engineering colleges, as is an autonomous institution, so mm. the major problem that uh, we are actually uh, observing is uh, uh, we feel the feeling mm. is there that uh, due to NEP, a lot of core courses are being compromised. So mm. the number of credits has been reduced mm. and uh, the percentage of courses for humanities and mm. uh, management that mm. has been increased. So we are seeing that core courses like the core engineering courses have to be compromised. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, amount of uh, uh, credits that were uh, set for that has been reduced. And that is, yeah, of course, it's a 
uh, it's a challenge probably we need to see how we can do it in coming years <laughs> okay so one aspect that you are trying to say is that this multidisciplinary view of uh, you know curriculum uh, that is is it more of a issue of acceptance or uh, is it uh, much more serious than that in terms of uh, thing is affecting? we have to accommodate uh, uh, courses for uh, humanities and uh, management so we have to take out the courses and then our credits itself have been reduced. So okay. uh, that is basically right now it's a it's a very uh, issue that is creating a lot of friction among the co colleagues also because uh, their subjects are going out of uh, the syllabus or they are being moved from core courses to elective courses. Yeah, that's right. But uh, my question is that that is what, because change is happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Changes. Uh, That's what so, it's, it's, it's I, change. the change is good for the students and uh, change has to be accepted by faculty or, uh, um, you know, uh, is it, uh, you know, other way around? No, actually, uh, I think with a broader perspective, with what they are trying to implement is they want to have students with multiple skills, not just right. courses. He needs to have some background of... Uh, uh, humanity, some background mm. of, uh, let us say, management. Mm. But on that side, we are compromising the students with the core strength, which is... No, doc, Dr. Sharath, uh, you know, my question to you, you, uh, what do you teach? Yeah, I teach mechanical engineering students. Mechanical. Uh, so um, let me not ask how many students are there and all that. <laughs> uh, compared to when you studied mechanical, what is it now? Overall, across colleges, had the number of uh, people aspiring to become medical, I mean, mechanical engineers come down? Yeah. Um, currently, I think uh, with the trend of work from home going, the core branches have taken a hit. Hit, but okay. First, first thing. Second, even if somebody, uh, you know, actually um, uh, joins a mechanical engineering course, uh, do you think uh, a large majority of them get uh, jobs in so-called uh, core sector or core companies where their mechanical knowledge is directly used? Yes. It depends upon the colleges, like the premium colleges or the top colleges, students do make it to mechanical engineering courses. But uh, when we come after top 10% of colleges, all mechanical engineers, the opportunities is very less because my Bangalore is basically correct. IT hub. So correct, correct. So not just, Bangalore, not just Bangalore, in many colleges across the entire country, this kind of a situation is happening, right? So then the question is, unless uh, there is a possibility of multidisciplinarity and employability, then uh, there is an issue for uh, the students undergoing the course, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the whole idea is based on that. Uh, the issue is, therefore, what will happen to the faculty and, uh, you know, how would they have to take this? Uh, would they have to think themselves as a multidisciplinary faculty member and uh, somebody from mechanical engineering also thinking about industrial engineering and then slowly production, operations, management, etc. That kind of a shift also probably might, uh, you know, take place, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's the norm. If you look at uh, uh -huh. uh, teachers, like what they were teaching 20 years before, uh, uh -huh. they won't be teaching the same now. It's very Correct. dynamic and evolving. Correct. So, which which is more of, uh, you know, change in mindset of the faculty rather than, uh, you know, uh, a real serious issue of implementation, right? Yeah, yeah, true, true, true. Correct, correct. Okay. Anybody else uh, would like to give their views? Because uh, what I am trying to understand is uh, there are these key principles. Where is it that uh, you think are the issues in implementation? Yes, sir. 
Yeah, one yes. more point I want. Uh, now I just uh, remind. Uh, sir, Rajesh, is it? Yes, sir. Sir, now yeah. uh, hmm. uh, suppose you take the example, sir. How, uh, some hmm. commerce and uh, art students example. Uh, okay. They are not ready to take up different challenges like uh, multidisciplinary. Hmm. Uh, suppose they will think always easy point, uh, sir. Even uh, suppose if I give open elective market, they will hmm. they will not uh, opt for finance in commerce itself. They will not go for tough subjects mm. and uh, mm. this is what uh, and mm. our syllabus focus more uh, more, more uh, they will pressure uh, syllabus based uh, and critical thinking based uh, it is mm. lacking sir uh, you you are saying in uh, even after the implementation of nep yes sir uh, more uh, for uh, we are even uh, we are also tired up with uh, completing mm. the syllabus sir. and uh, mm -hmm. suppose you take the example 100 marks sir. 40 marks hmm. is internal and hmm. uh, uh, 60 marks is external. 40 yeah, that has not changed. That has not changed. Uh, for 5, 5, 5, 5. Suppose hmm. for 40 marks divided into 8 criteria. Okay. We don't have time to what we have uh, to give more time to students. Hmm. And we are in uh, teachers itself. We are a little uh, confusion uh, uh, which what we have to focus. We have to complete syllabus or we have to complete eight criteria. Actually, eight criteria is good, sir. Mm. Party mm. marks internal, it is good, but mm. syllabus also huge. Mm. Mm. That is what critical thinking and uh, creativity. Mm. So that's not happening. That's not happening. That, that's that is not happening. They should reduce. But continuous syllabus. review is happening. Uh, continuous review we are doing, sir, but uh, yeah, teachers are putting more efforts. Mm. And uh, we are. Uh, I don't know other colleges. Our colleges, uh, mm. suppose uh, we are not leaving uh, four thirty. Even mm. it will continue till uh, five thirty, six o'clock sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. Uh, so I just thought this will make the you know discussion uh, much more useful and relevant for others also because we are looking at key principles of NEP. But at the same time, based on these key principles, can we think about what are the kind of issues that actually come up? And it's good that uh, there are people from uh, Karnataka, like Dr. Rajesh, uh, talking about already something getting implemented and what kind of challenges that they have faced. Okay. Now, um, we will look at some, uh, some more of the aspects that have been talked about in uh, you know the NEP 2020. Um, we said flexibility of the subjects, which we already talked about. Multiple entry and exit, again, uh, you know, uh, with appropriate uh, certification, what are the kind of issues that uh, one would face in implementation we have already talked about. Now, um, if you take the European context, the next aspect um, uh, that is academic bank of credits to be established to facilitate transfer of credits which is basically like uh, what uh, Dr. Rajesh was mentioning right now. Uh, if I am to shift from one university to another, uh, the credits that I have taken in another university, will they be con considered equivalent? Uh, are all the universities operating in the same number of uh, credits? And uh, will the transfer be accepted uh, easily? Is a question mark. Because in terms of implementation, uh, I think uh, one credit is equal to how much? Is the semester operating in the same start time and end time and uh, the examinations, etc.? These are all aspects which have to come in when you are talking of, uh, you know, the facilitation of transfer of credits. Uh, because if the uh, semester starts at different times, uh, or if it's a trimester versus a semester, um, uh, then we get into a situation or if it's an autonomous college versus, a, you know, a university-based college, a private institution versus, a, you know, government institution, etc. Uh, equivalence of credits, even now it's there, but then across universities, middle of the semester or middle of the program or middle of the year, um, you know, will transfer of credits happen? If so, how? 
uh, what is the way in which it will be affected, etc. I think these are all issues which relate to um, you know implementation. Right. Uh, the other aspect that's being talked about here. Uh, you know, if I am to take uh, one of them is affiliation system to be phased out in 15 years. Okay. That means the concept of affiliated colleges, uh, which are related to a affiliating university itself is sought to be uh, phased out. What that means is that uh, every individual, uh, you know, uh, institution in itself becomes an autonomous institution. Okay, but at the same time, we are saying that it should be autonomous and multidisciplinary. And uh, if I am to get back to this uh, issue of academic bank of credits, unless the credit system is understood equally by all the institution, then again, uh, autonomous, whether it is government autonomous, it's uh, private autonomous, that question also comes in. And since... Uh, Education is also in the concurrent list, which means there are, uh, you know, central institutions, there are state level institutions, and uh, then you have uh, private and, uh, you know, how does the academic bank of credit work when there is no affiliation system and, uh, you know, uh, with autonomy to the colleges in terms of uh, you know, administrative, financial, and academic autonomy, how does it match with other institutions, uh, maybe even within the same state or different states? I think is a big issue uh, when we are talking of uh, this transferability of uh, credits. Uh, but if you look at uh, the European context, uh, you know, they have ECTS or a European credit transfer system where, uh, you know, you study a certain number of credits in one institution in one country and then shift to another country and then another institution for the next set of credits and one more country for the next set of credits before you complete your program. Now, if uh, in the European context, they have been able to implement it, uh, within the Indian context, when we have uh, systems almost very similar, is it not possible to implement is a uh, question that we need to ask. So even if the affiliation system goes and every college or university or uh, education institution becomes autonomous, can we not bring in easy, um, what we call almost like uh, mobile number portability, student portability, program portability, uh, course portability from one institution to uh, another. Uh, that's an implementation issue uh, with regard to one of the aspects of the National Education Policy 2020 that we are talking of. Right. So um, at this point of time, I thought uh, we'll take a short break. We'll take 10 minutes break and then uh, we'll get, get back with the uh, you know, few more uh, aspects of NEP 2020 implementation. And then uh, some more time to take up uh, any points that we have discussed across in both the first as well as the second session. Okay. Can we take a break for 10 minutes and be back? Hello? Yes, sir. Ah, okay.
Hello, good evening once again. Uh, are we all ready to start? Yes. Sir. Okay. Are you able to hear me clearly? And yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um. Yes, sir. So we were, uh, you know, looking at uh, this particular slide uh, in terms of trying to understand some of the implementation issues based on uh, some of the aspects that are mentioned here. Uh, I just want to take up only two aspects here. One is the National Research Foundation. I think uh, one of the problems that we face across in um, you know uh, the current context in india is uh, that these research uh, uh, grants or funding come from different kinds of agencies and we don't have a common way in which to get all this information in one place so most of the institutions actually struggle with uh, getting information on uh, you know uh, funding that is available in research and uh, government is done separately, other kind of institutions separately, you know, private has got a separate kind of, a, you know, a way of attracting, uh, you know, proposals for funding, etc. I think a national research foundation, if it can, uh, you know, bring in all this together in one place, uh, would uh, foster a strong, uh, you know, research culture. That is what it is. But um, implementation of this part um, uh, is something that is quite uh, tough. And I'm not sure uh, how much of effort has gone in in terms of uh, uh, getting this to happen. Uh, the other part is about uh, trying to reach out to different kinds or sections of, uh, you know, uh, people who would require education, basically, uh, you know, in terms of gender and, you know, disadvantaged regions and groups, etc. Uh, this is, again, a very difficult, uh, you know, aspect in terms of implementation, which I thought I will just uh, highlight at this point of time. Um, the This slide actually talks about... Uh, you know, a few other things which have not been covered uh, till now, uh, you know, in this presentation, which is like uh, uh, one is uh, probably in, term, in terms of talking of uh, the nomenclature, they say Ministry of Human Resources is now Ministry of Education. And then that's not too much of a, you know, big change. Uh, but uh, one thing that's being talked about is this, um, you know, scholastic aptitude test like SAT, like uh, common test uh, by a national testing agency to uh, for college entrance examination twice a year. You know, as uh, you are all aware that uh, for different kinds of after, I mean, in the current context after 12th standard, Though that is changing from 10 plus 2 to 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. Um, at the end of 5 plus 3 plus 3, you know, the point here is that uh, many of the students and the parents get into this issue of how many examinations to write for different kinds of programs. And therefore, there is a big, uh, you know, confusion in term at the time of admissions and uh, different institutions conduct examinations at different times, some early, some late, some give admissions early, etc. And uh, there is no way to understand exactly, you know, on what basis people are joining, uh, the students are joining different kinds of programs in different locations and different uh, kind of institutions. If there is one examination and that is used as a common college entrance exam and it has got different components based on which whether it is engineering, 
or basic sciences or if it is uh, you know life sciences or medicine and things like that uh, if there is a common examination and if, if you are not going to multiple places to write multiple examination pay multiple application fees uh, and all of that uh, this kind of a system definitely is something that is uh, helpful which is having one national testing agency and that national testing agency conducting one examination with multiple components and depending upon the requirement of the program uh, each uh, uh, college university or program can choose the candidates based on the uh, marks or ranks that are obtained but then this is a drastic or a major change in terms of uh, what we are looking at in the uh, whatever is the current condition with regard to admissions and i think um, um, implementation of this or changing the uh, you know current system is going to be a tough task because it involves money it involves organizing it it wants change in the uh, you know uh, mindset uh, for different stakeholders who are involved in this entire uh, you know exercise and therefore this is an implementation uh, challenge though the you know national education policy 2020 talks about uh, this particular uh, you know aspect no affiliation we've already discussed about this um you know four year bachelors which is again a, you know you know different kind of a system and so i think uh, even in karnataka and other places where you know any implementation is happening um what to do in the fourth year of a four year uh, bachelors program you know one has to provide uh, opportunities for multiple you know uh, routes for branching out uh, you know education across in uh, multiple uh, you know interests namely somebody is interested in research one can pursue research after bachelors one is interested in getting into education then it's okay one wants to get into you know you know, a different field altogether, is there a possibility, etc. You know, that's again, uh, you know, how do we actually implement it is uh, kind of an issue that one uh, faces. And I thought um, this is also one of the aspects that we can, uh, you know, look at. Um, another dimension which has got uh, implementation issues will be fee cap. It is uh, a limit, maximum limit uh, on what is the fee that will be charged for different programs, different institutions, especially in the context of uh, higher education, uh, where uh, there are a lot of private institutions of higher learning and um, how would that be, uh, you know, implemented? Would there be, you know, grading of institutions and on, and on the basis of which there will be different uh, fee that they will be entitled to charge. Would it be same for all programs? Would it be different for different kinds of programs based on the demand in the industry? Uh, you know, those are all different kind of questions, which again uh, would take time with regard to implementation. But I think uh, these are some of the factors which I thought uh, uh, which will be issues that will go on a debate for quite some time before implementation and I, uh, I thought many of you must be aware of this also and uh, this is an opportunity for us to think about uh, these uh, while uh, looking for uh, you know some of the uh, good ideas that have come in in NEP 2020 for the purpose of implementation okay so I will stop here and uh, now what I will uh, do is to provide some time uh, for you to uh, raise questions or give your uh, uh, views on um, uh, the two broad uh, you know aspects on which we had sessions uh, today 
any one of you and i would especially request um, other than probably dr rajesh and dr sharath others kindly uh, you know kind of participate or give your view points or ask questions yes please unmute yourself and you can i think i am seeing dr raj shekar dr hemant reddy chandra shekar dr kiran yes any one of you your views or you can ask questions hello sir ah uh, yes please go ahead uh, i mean who is this hello sir i am audible to you hello sir yeah i am uh, you are audible you are audible uh, please introduce yourself and then speak is it hemant reddy can you please unmute and speak now you... i think internet access is an issue i suppose anybody else sir hemant reddy sir is back yeah uh, i was just wondering who was trying to ask the question or share his views is it kiran sir i just uh, want to ask a question uh, okay sir regarding yeah uh, sir in digital marketing uh, you said about uh, sustainable food and nutrition security it will be uh, means impact of digital agriculture for farmers small farmers they can adopt digital farming to uh, increase their income and uh, uh, by adopting the technologies and all correct is it really adoptable by small farmers and uh, they are, it's uh, whether it is impact on their income yeah so the see uh, final implementation by uh, you know the individual farmers whether they are small or big depends also on whether it is cost effective and what are the benefits that one gets okay right as yes. of now um you know um, let me give you an example so that you understand exactly what is the you know nature of implementation um a person known to me actually runs a startup which uh, works on actually uh, bringing in some kind of a digitization uh, with regard to managing uh, you know uh, a diary okay more specifically what they want to bring in is uh, tagging of individual uh, diary animals uh trying to find out uh, you know their intake of uh, you know different kinds of feed also trying to continuously monitor uh, you know the stage of uh, reproduction of the uh, animal and uh, uh, do one more aspect which is monitor the health of the animal not just the reproductive health in general the health of the animal in terms of for example whether it has been vaccinated or not now if you are talking of trying to monitor all of this the first thing is to relate it to the identity of the animal for which you need a technology of uh, you know trying to uh, uh, put in some uh, kind of a sensor on its uh, body for example instead of a you know tag which is a plastic one can you infuse it with a you know chip so that it can be identified that is the first thing the second thing is 
for each one of the individual animals, you need to actually uh, input data so that you know exactly each and every animal, uh, you know, what are the kind of uh, feed, what is its age, what's happening to its general health, reproductive health, etc. All of this has to be done. And on the basis of continuous monitoring, then you can change the feed, uh, provide health services on the basis of its health condition, improve the reproductive capacity, etc. Because of continuous monitoring, because as of now, it's not happening. Now, um, if you are a farmer with one animal versus uh, if you are a you know dairy farm that uh, deals with 100 animals, you know, uh, what will be the capacity of the, uh, you know, farmer in order to implement this digital uh, technology, if you are asking this question? Um, yes. You know, probably for an um, individual farmer, it may be easy. But then there are other issues like, say, for example, uh, whether he will have the capability to you know, somehow capture this data and put it in the digital form and all of that. Whereas if it is to be done for 100, then you must have a different technology which will be able to capture this rather than uh, have the same technology where for every individual, um, you know, uh, animal, you have to capture all the data all the time, right? So will, uh, you know, um, help in, uh, digitalization or digitization of an individual farmer with one cow uh, becomes easy or the implementation in a you know dairy farm with 100 animals becomes easy if you look at it that way uh, the question uh, actually can be answered this way that it depends upon the uh, divisibility of the technology one, it becomes easy because one time you collect the data about this one animal and continuously are able to monitor, etc. For one, it is easy. You need not employ uh, any uh, help from outside. But if it is to be continuously monitored for 100, will you be able to do it? Right? So, uh, yes. you know, the question actually depends upon, I mean, your question actually relates to the nature of technology and adoption. Okay. If it is divisible, if it is something that can be tried even at the individual small farm level, I think it's still possible, right? Uh, so okay, may, maybe I have given a very long-winded answer, but uh, we cannot give a very generalized answer to this question because it depends upon the nature of the technology. That is one. Second thing is, it also depends on the cost, right? So if yes, costs come correct. down, then probably, you know, even a person with 100 animals will be able to afford it because he will employ people in order to capture uh, data, uh, which can, uh, you know, take care of the, you know, which will balance out the higher cost involved in employing labor for doing that job because the technology itself is uh, quite cost effective. So there are multiple factors and I think we need to take that into consideration. We cannot give a general answer to question that you are asking, but it's very important, you know, in terms of understanding how digital technology will proceed in terms of adoption at the individual farm level or the farmer level and the nature of technology across in different kind of context. Yes, sir. Thanks for your word. Hello. Any other question? Anybody else? Has Hello. Sir, in chat, there is no question. Uh, Kiran, I think I am not able to hear you clearly. Sir, in chat box, there is a question. How to hmm. identify agricultural product is purely organic? Uh, very good question. I think uh, Dr. Hemant Reddy is asking this question, right? Yes, is he yes, there? Sir. Is he there? Yes, sir. Okay. 
um so there are uh, organic i think uh, there are different ways in which uh, you get an organic product into the market uh, one thing is what is called as certified organic okay where you have a certification uh, you know by a reputed agency and uh, you have to trust that certification for uh, you know whether the product is organic or not the second one is uh, self certification which is like uh, you certify that uh, for yourself that it is uh, organic somebody has to believe you so there is third party certification there is uh, you know self certification um now without certification um it is difficult to identify whether a product is organic or not because um you know let's say for example you are buying brinjal you know organic brinjal will look the same as uh, you know a brinjal where pesticide has been applied all right so if that is the case how do you make the distinction it's only because of some kind of a certification unless in the future a technology comes where uh, you know based on the skin color color or some other features of the product you can make a distinction between organic and uh, Uh, not an organic uh, product the sir we second identify second. manually no we can huh? uh, identify easily because uh, some uh, insects uh, will be there in uh, what uh, pesticides no that's true but uh, you know uh, whether you are uh, yes, uh, can point identify. is if there are more of no no no, no. there is more of uh, you know pests in a uh, brinjal you can say that it is organic but uh, that can also happen if there is a high infestation of pest in spite of the use of pesticide right so it's not a very easy task or job to find out by the consumer just on the face of it uh, physically by examining examining physically one cannot say that a product is organic or not organic okay oh, yes sir. so therefore what is required is some certification okay but more importantly the next step which is coming in where the digital agri business component actually uh, comes uh, through is whether i will be able to trace uh, the origin of this particular if i am to take the example of brinjal in itself whether i will be able to trace the origin of brinjal and therefore find out actually go to that farm which is maybe let's say 40 50 kilometers away uh go and actually find out really whether organic agriculture is being followed in that particular uh, farm when they are raising brinjal compared to uh, any other product that is available which means with uh, blockchain technology and digital uh, you know traceability of uh, this particular product uh it's possible to even authenticate whether this product is uh, really Mm, organic or not uh, this is the only way in which we can try and make it uh, as authentic as possible or trust whether something is organic or not is that uh, uh, did i answer your question or is it satisfying in terms of whatever i gave as an answer yes sir yes sir we satisfied but uh, some people are misusing sir this uh, organic that this the, they will um, in uh, okay. business people uh, misusing they yeah, are we can we can do much about it uh, we have to become aware we have to use technology and we have to find out uh, what is fake what is real and uh, that's the way yeah. in which probably we can make a difference how uh, people will identify sir that's the major reason uh, they will not identify no, no, physically it's not possible physically it's not possible yes yes sir, yes, sir. Yeah. so i think uh, it's already time i think probably okay. many of you might be going to bed by this time so okay. we'll stop here thank okay. you so much for uh, you know participating and uh, being part of this uh, second day of this program um Uh, is there any other formality yes, that we have to complete yeah uh, yes sir good evening everyone present here so i sangavi mp coordinator from indian institute of plantation management bengaluru take this opportunity to thank 
Professor Shiv Kumar Ye, sir, from VIT Business School, Vailur, for sharing an immense insights on evolution and factors leading to digitalization in agriculture. And in the second session, it was really most, uh, uh, it was a talk on most important topic that is national education policy, its key aspects and the issues in national uh, education policies. Sir, I thank you wholeheartedly for handling this session and making it a grand success. I thank our coordinators from Indian Institute of Plantation Management, Bengaluru for handling and coordinating this session. I also thank each and every participants for uh, encouraging for your uh, immense uh, participation and making this program and the session a very great success. And uh, it is, there is a very small note for all the participants. We request everybody to please join the program on time, that is at 7 o'clock, uh, because of which the session will be delayed at last. So by this, from our Indian Institute of Plantation Management, Bengaluru, we thank each and every one of you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank sir. You, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. And sir, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.